Cool. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our virtual career day series. My name is Lynn Nguyen, and I am the young adult librarian from Chinatown Branch Library. Uh, welcome, everybody. And then I'm also here with my co-host, Jessica Levy from Palisades. You'll see her in the camera hey. right there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the chat box is there, so please feel free to use it. Uh, we're so excited to have you here for our weekly virtual career day series where we introduce amazing careers to you. Today we, ha today we have two amazing guest speakers uh, from the business industry, and they're here to share some tips and tricks and provide you from some, uh, with some insight on how they got into their profession. We would like to extend our deepest thanks to all of you, our participants, uh, the, our guest speakers, the Library Foundation, and the Friends of the Chinatown Branch Library for their generous support. Before we begin, I would like to go over some housekeeping rules. Your microphones are already muted, and you do not need to have your cameras turned on. The recording is in progress, and if you do wish to ask questions at any time during this session, please do feel free to use the chat box. Um, if you end, of course, at the very end, there is going to be Q&A, so you are welcome to unmute yourself and ask your questions directly to our guest speakers. And, uh, you know, so please don't be shy. We're here to help. We hope you enjoyed today's career day, and please remember to complete our very short survey at the end of the program. So with that being said, I would like to ask all of you to open up your chat box. We're going to start with our popcorn question. And the popcorn question for all of you is, what is your favorite flower or plant? <laughs> well, we'd love to learn more about what, what everybody loves. All right, I see Tulip and Rose. Oh boy. Oh, this is a good one. <laughs> so, you know, I have a, we have a professional florist here, uh, Jackie, and then a professional photographer named uh, Zsa, Zsa from the Bay Area, and they are experts at uh, different roses and plants. So what do you guys think of all these names that uh, our, guests, our, our, our guests are coming up with? I think it's good that there's such a variety of flowers that people know about. Um, I saw someone put anemones, so there's anemones right here. Um, I did see a lot of roses, lilies, sunflowers, which are all super beautiful and long lasting. So it's exciting that people know all these names, yeah. gems, it's all flowers. Wow. <laughs> this is amazing. Yes, yeah, so, so the list goes on and on. So um, let's, uh, let's go ahead. So while everybody is still typing in their um, answers. I would like to first introduce uh, our first guest speaker, Jaja. Jaja Ling is a wedding and lifestyle photographer from San Francisco Bay Area. She was able to successfully launch her photography business after pursuing a bachelor's degree in graphic design. She takes an honest approach to wedding photography and earns her couple's trust to capture their love story. So um, I would like to go ahead and share a few slides with you, a, a slide deck with you right now, or a slideshow with you right now. And this does include both Jaja and Jackie's work. Okay, so everybody, um, and just a reminder, uh, the sound might be a little loud, so please feel free to turn down your volume if it's too loud. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen real quick. And...
so beautiful. I hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> so, Jaja, please tell us your uh, please tell us the name of your business and what does your job entail? All right. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, my wedding photography business is basically using my name, Jaja Photography. Um, I do wedding and lifestyle photography in the Bay Area, but I do some traveling beyond too. That's awesome. When did you realize that you had a craft for taking beautiful pictures? When was um, the aha moment? <laughs> um, I think I was very lucky to grow up with my father as a wedding photographer. So I was his assistant for a while, but once I started high school, I still photograph with him, but I wanna try something different. So I studied graphic design and then studied graphic design college. But after that, I still found photography as my calling. And so um, picked that up as my full-time work now. When you said that you went to school for graphic design, what was your initial purpose uh, for studying graphic design? Oh, I just want to become a graphic designer, um, you know, working for a design firm, designing um, more mostly visual designs too. Um, but after college, I did have full time work with graphic design, but I was still freelancing photography on the side. And it got so overwhelming to the point where I was just happier doing photos and it was hard to admit, but um, it was definitely um, eye-opening once I decided on that. That's beautiful. And what was it that inspired you to choose this career path when you shifted to photography? Um, I think it's just how rewarding um, working with couples. Um, because they trust so much um, for you to document their special day. And being part of that is such an honor. And then having them see their beautiful photos that you've taken afterwards and then loving it is what um, makes it so rewarding. Um, and then what keeps me going too, just like being there for my couples and making sure they have um, a wonderful wedding day and also beautiful photos after. Awesome. Uh, would you be able to walk us through um, your like your day to day life as a wedding photographer? Like from the moment somebody reaches out to you and says, hey, I'd love to, you know, for you to take our pictures. Like what are the steps that you go to ensure that they have this whole entire life of their life moments documented in such a beautiful way? Um, so there's a lot of admin work when it comes to working for yourself as a photographer. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a few meetings, you know, discussing all the little details um, to make sure, you know, they feel comfortable or at least they have um, better grasp of how the wedding day is going to be versus someone like me who's, you know, been to many weddings. It's easy for me to help them on that. Um, and then there's the booking. Um, dates on their wedding day, sometimes engagement session too, which is a very nice way to bond with them, but it's mostly um, communication and you have to be very self-driven to work with yourself. <laughs> what are some of the challenges as a wedding photographer and running this type of business? Um, I think it's hard because you can't help but to compare yourself to, there's so many photographers out there now, um, especially with um, digital cameras. It makes it a lot easier. Um, and also figure out, you know, what style you are and what kind of service you wanna do in photography. Cause like earlier I was talking to a wedding photographer friend and we, we both do wedding photography, but we attract different couples. Um, so it's just like, it's such a huge, um, variety of photography in within weddings too but I think it's just like you know really putting yourself out there and discover that do you have any career highlights or stories that you can share about your wedding or your I mean your wedding business um I think the 
one point was um, seeking cri criticism or critiques on my work because um, there's always room for improvements as a photographer. And um, I would reach out to photographers to second shoot for them and have them look over my work with them. Um, it's always nice to have like a second eye to check on your work and you learn new things along the way as long as you open yourself to it. Um, and it's hard to hear because it's all, you know, there's some good parts and there's negative parts, but I think that's what makes you a stronger photographer. Do you have any um, tips for our teens that are interested in, you know, start becoming a photographer? If like, what are the first steps that you did uh, or that you took when, when you started out as a photographer? Um, first, it was um, I surround myself with good friends as my practice subjects, <laughs> like Jackie here, who's a florist. We've known each other since high school. Um, so, you know, and like um, reaching out to photographers to assist them versus second shooting for them. I think you can learn a lot just by like being by their side and seeing how they work um, and eventually um, gradually get to second photographer, becoming a second photographer to a main photographer, you will learn a lot that way too. But it is a small, it's a bit of sacrifice in the beginning in order to gain experience. What are some skills or attributes um, you feel that are necessary for anyone interested in turning their passion, such as photography, into a business? Um, I think it has to do with a lot of um, self-belief um, because you have to be um, like a self-starter and be confident in order to start a business and keep it running, right? Um, and also be okay that you will be making mistakes along the way. That's what happens to any business when you're starting off. But if you keep striving, it does get better. How do you hone in on your skills to keep your competitive edge since there are many photographers out there? Um, it is competitive, but lately what's been nice about um, social media, we've been discovering um, community over competition so it's really nice to connect with um, other photographers and actually be inspired by their work or inspire each other. Um, that way, you know, it's, it just helps you keep moving forward versus being yourself down that you're not getting any better or you don't have some sort of support. But I think definitely you know, connect with others that are like you versus looking at competition. That's great advice. Um, has the pandemic affected your job in any, in any way? Oh, it's affected a lot. <laughs> um, since there's weddings, I shoot weddings and a lot of weddings the past year were canceled or postponed or rescheduled. Um, it did teach me to be more reasonable with my clients and more understanding. And sometimes you kind of have to push the business side aside and treat your clients like a friend. Um, but I think things will be getting better. But um, to keep myself busy, I was fortunate to take like um, lifestyle or family photos, which I didn't have time to focus on before. So it's always nice to like branch out and try something different. Um, I know you touched on this a bit, but are there uh, any type of internship opportunities out there available for uh, in students or teens who want to become a photographer? Um, I think the first step was to invest on a camera with a good lens. That doesn't have to be like a super expensive camera or the latest, greatest camera. I think cameras from like even five, five six years ago are still wonderful cameras to start with. Um, and it's definitely a lot of practice and offering free photo shoots in order for you to practice and then get better. 
Um, but yeah, definitely um, find some photographers that you admire that are local that you can probably reach out and see if they would like um, looking for an assistant for any of the events they have. That's great advice. Um, would you be able to share with us what type of camera you use and some of the tools that has helped you elevate your business along the way? Um, so my dad has always shot with Canon. So I grew up with Canon cameras, so all my cameras are Canon. <laughs> um, but I do have two camera bodies, always have one as a backup, especially for weddings, because um, you never know what can happen. Um, and then I would have um, multiple lenses for different scenarios, but there's some lenses that you can get as a good start. Um, I would start with that and practice with that, really understand how to use the camera. And also you will need to learn all the rules before you can break them for sure. Do you, what type of um, editing software or websites uh, or resources do you use to edit your, your photos? Um, I use Lightroom and um, Photoshop. So Lightroom makes a lot easier to process multiple photos um, of a wedding day. And then a Photoshop is great for um, detailed touch-ups. Are there uh, any type of conferences uh, or um, websites where photographers can gather to discuss their craft? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, one of my favorite is called SLR Lounge website. There's a lot of like free tutorials and information available. Um, what's great about YouTube, there's so many videos too that can teach you like how to properly light things or what um, settings you should be shooting with and different settings. Um, there's so much resource out there for photography. I mean, photos are everywhere. So it's, um, it's really easy access to get to. That's awesome. Um, what are some of the best tips or advice that you can give to teens that um, want to become a photographer, let's say in the middle of this pandemic? And um, you know, what are some other uh, advice that you can give them uh, if they want to, let's say, they, let's say they don't, they don't start off as a wedding photographer, but they start off as a lifestyle photographer or any type of photographer, like what is like the, the ultimate advice that has helped you that you want to pass on to them? Um, I definitely think it's important to find joy in sharing your work because when you're taking pictures of photos of your subjects, um, you're also bringing joy to them to have these beautiful photos too. Um, definitely like, you know, don't be afraid to try new things or different, for example, like some people are only comfortable sharing during the daylight. Um, don't be afraid to go to like sunset or um, to what we call twilight, which is like right after sunset time for photos. It's just like finding creative ways to really um, branch out your skills. And I think that would we bring more confidence in your work too. So since uh, there is just so much work that you do, especially when, you know, back before this pandemic began and you were going to many different weddings, I'm sure every weekend, uh, what were some of the things that you did to, uh, for self-care? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I invested on a massage chair because <laughs> it's so exhausting taking weddings because you're on your feet for about 10 hours a day uh, and nonstop. It's just like, you know, photographers spend so much time with the wedding couple and we're just right by the side. But yeah, um, I think it's um, also once you get to a point where you get really busy, you kind of have to learn how to have work and life balance and also learn to say no to some clients because you can only do so much. And um, I feel like doing less, I'm able to give more to my clients. That's great advice. And my last question for you is, if you could turn back time, what is one advice that you would tell yourself to your teenage self that just barely got out of high school? Um, I think don't be afraid to jump into something what feels right. Like for me, I was 
afraid to pursue photography after seeing what my dad went through because it was a lot of hard work and um and the way that technology changed also really affects our work too um and I feel like if I had a chance, I would tell myself, just go to photography full on early on if I could have, versus waiting two years after college to figure that out. We have one question here from the audience that asked, oh. <laughs> have you encountered any bridezillas? <laughs> Um, I try to interview my couples in advance to make sure we're a good match. Um, if I sense of some bridezilla, I try to turn them down, but sometimes they don't come out until later. I have groomzillas more than bridezillas, actually. So, <laughs> oh, would you be able to share like a quick snippet or, or story of this groomzilla? <laughs> oh, I had this, I had this groom who was. Usually I have brides who interview me, but once in a while I have a groom who's into photography as well, uh, will be the one who's has the, um, who has to contribute to the wedding plan as picking their wedding photographer. And he would tell me that he interviewed 30 photographers and we would go through this long process of like how many photos they're gonna get, how do I edit my photos, down to like the littlest details. And then his bride, his back then was fiance, wasn't available. So, and then I had to go through that again with her um, separately because they were doing long distance in the beginning. And um, after the wedding, they counted every single photos I took. <laughs> Wow. And then just back and forth questions. Okay. How do you advertise your company? Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's very important to invest on yourself, right? So spending money on marketing. Um, for me, I advertise with The Knot, which is a pretty well-known wedding magazine, also online website. Um, it's expensive. But if you book a few weddings, it will cover the cost. So I think that's um, one way to look at it. Um, yeah, that's how I advertise myself. That's a great question. Oh, all right. I'll just. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, how many clients are based on word of mouth versus advertisements? Um, that's a very good question. So after a few years into the business, I started getting clients like a bride's bridesmaids got engaged and then she would want to hire me or someone their guests would hire me. And I think I'm at the point where about half of my clients are word of mouth, but lately I have been getting more wedding planners bringing me clients. So all great questions. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know, guys, we're, we can uh, definitely have Q more Q&A at the very end. I'm going to turn this over to Jessica. Jaja, thank you. It was so great interviewing you and getting to know you. Thank you so <laughs> much, guys. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jaja. So our next guest is Jackie Ching. And let me just introduce her. She is a florist based in the Bay Area as well. She began her career in floral over 12 years ago at a local market and followed her love of flowers to Las Vegas, where she worked for six years as a floral designer at Wynn Resorts, executing large scale events, weddings and galas. After moving back home to the Bay Area, she continued her career as lead floral designer for an established event company and is now independently operating as a small business. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you for being here. Thank you. So tell us, um, do you have a company name or do you go by your name? I actually also go by my name, uh, Jacqueline Ching Design. Very nice. Um, so tell us more about what your job entails, if, if at the moment you're able to do work or what kind of projects that you're typically involved with. Um, okay, so as a floral designer, um, you actually go through a lot of steps. So I go through everything from you know, initial concept creation to sourcing flowers and materials to um, budgeting and then eventually creation and then processing, prepping, cleaning. So it's actually a lot more than most people think of when they think of a floral designer, but um, it's cool to be able to 
do all those different aspects of design. And what kind of venues do you typically work with as far as a, being a floral designer? Um, so I actually also do like, I do home deliveries, I do weddings, I also do large scale galas such as um, the San Francisco Symphony, which takes place in uh, San Francisco City Hall. Um, so it really takes you everywhere, actually, a little bit of travel to, you know, Los Angeles, um, pretty much anywhere anyone wants to host an event. <laughs> And how, so we know that you started work in a floral shop. So do you want to tell us more about that? What, what was your start with flowers? Were you always interested in plants as a child? Um, actually, it's funny because I wasn't that interested in floral design to start out. Um, it was a summer job when I was in college. So it's funny because Zsa, Zsa was actually a floral designer for a little bit. So she um, taught me some basics when she found out that I was planning on applying to a floral design job. And because I have a background in art, um, I just took the, the little tips that she taught me and I applied for this job. And then I eventually just ended up falling in love with it, which was super unexpected. It wasn't something that I planned at all. That's great. Uh, so what had, did you go to college? Did you study something else? You mentioned art, so tell us more about that. Uh, so I went to college for studio art. So I studied um, painting and sculpture which I actually think is a uh, very helpful in floral design because it gives you that background in you know, color theory, um, just making things sculpturally, just, just building and painting. So that helps a lot. And I'm actually very grateful to be, you know, there's not a lot of art majors who actually get to practice art after they graduate. So I feel very lucky that I'm still in that kind of field, that kind of creative field. Yeah, that's great to hear. So, after that first job that you, that um, Zsa, Zsa encouraged you to go for, how did you progress from that job? And then tell us maybe more about that particular job. And then how did you get from there to starting your own business? Uh, so my job at the local market, um, it was really good to learn the basics of floral design. Um, I learned a lot about each different type of flower because I spent a lot of time processing flowers. And by processing, I mean like you receive them in bunches and then you take off all the leaves and you clean them and make sure they're, um, they're ready for like bunch sales. So learning that kind of uh, basics and I don't wanna call it dirty work, but because like it's kind of, you still have to do that as a florist all the time. But learning those basics really set me up to um, have a really good background in uh, floral design. Plus my just interest in learning all the names and the different uh, varieties of flowers. You really just have to kind of learn that on your own as well. So after that, I had a regular desk job and I found myself, you know, bringing flowers to my desk job, <laughs> kind of like a like crazy flower girl. And then I ended up missing flowers so much that um, I had a friend who said that there was an opening at Wynn Resorts where she worked. So I applied for that on a whim and they hired me right away. And I just flew out to Vegas and started working there. And um, ended up there for six years. So it was a really, really great learning experience because you don't get to learn those kind of large events um, at like a lot of smaller areas. So Vegas, there's those huge galas, huge events. So I learned a lot of design and speed and uh, was lucky to encounter so many beautiful types of flowers and expensive flowers that uh, like your local shop might not carry. <clears throat> so that, sorry, this is like really long. <laughs> no, that's okay. And so what, what are, before we even get to my question, my first question, what are, um, what was like some of the other big differences between working for a smaller flower shop versus, or a market versus um, a hotel or resort chain? Uh, so working at a hotel, you definitely, there's um, a larger team. So you end up working with about, you know, 18 to 20 other florists. So um, you really learn that kind of teamwork. And I eventually became a supervisor. So you learn how to uh, like teach other people skills, uh, work with others, because you can't really accomplish large galas by yourself. I mean, one person can't make like a hundred arrangements. So you have to learn to delegate those kind of responsibilities to other people. And also just the budgeting was a big difference. Um, I was lucky to work at a place where 
at the time budget wasn't really a concern. So <laughs> we didn't have to count like every single STEM, but we were able to, you know, uh, just make really beautiful, beautiful large scale things that you just want to be able to at a smaller, a right. smaller company. Mm -hmm. So you spent about six years with Wynn, you said, and then you, is, after that, did you branch out on your own? So actually after that, I always had a full-time floral job. I did freelance flowers on the side. So I did a lot of weddings on the side. Um, but after that, I moved back to the Bay Area and I worked as a lead floral designer for an event company up here, which also does those kind of large scale galas. Um, and then I was pretty much working as a florist like seven days a week. So after my regular job, I go home and work on more floral. <laughs> And like Josh just said, it does eventually get a little overwhelming because you have to choose uh, how to balance your work and life. Um, so actually, once the pandemic hit, um, obviously there's no more large events. So I was able to branch out on my own and it kind of gave me the push to really, really do my own business full time. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so what, as far as going into business on your own, what has been maybe has it been the pandemic what has been like the biggest challenge for you um the biggest challenge overall in my own business is kind of uh, budgeting <laughs> it's a huge challenge um because instead of you know uh basing it on a large-scale company budget you have to think about your own expenses uh your own overhead and as a florist, I think most florists will agree that you want to buy everything you see that you love, but you have to really hold back. And that's a huge challenge. <laughs> and just um, accounting and marketing, it's like you're your own one stop shop. So that's different from working for a larger company. Yeah. So I'm, I'm keeping distracted by the beautiful um, arrangements you have kind of peeking out on either side. Would you be able to share those with us and kind of explain to, for some of us like myself who need some help in putting together a nice arrangement, like what we should be looking for and how to determine what colors might go well together? Um, sure. So a lot of times for beginners, I do like to go with like a monochromatic palette. Um, so like you'll see here, there's like a light pink. These are pretty much various shades of pink, which I think creates like a very elegant kind of arrangement. Um, so the, as for beginners, I recommend that versus just like going all in with a ton of different colors. Um, also for me, I like a lot of movement. So you wanna make sure that each flower has its space to breathe, um, that they're not just like side by side and clustered, unless you like that style, that's up to you. <laughs> but for me personally, I like a little bit of movement and um, like a little bit of bounce. And you wanna make sure that you don't see a lot of uh, open space at the bottom. So for me, I cover the edge of the vase and just, I don't know, a lot of it is kind of just how you feel and what you love. <laughs> See, why do florists and designers always say those things as though it's, you know, everyone knows, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's kind of just like an intuition. That's what a lot of designers will say. Um, we don't all have your intuition, but it's lovely. <laughs> yeah. And your other um, bouquet is that, are those roses we see? Yes. Actually, this is just like a small little guy, um, oh. little accent one. Um, a lot of times I like to pair the larger arrangement with a smaller one down a table to give it like different height and different depth. Um, so you can kind of, we would like to call these satellite arrangements or bud bases. So it just adds a little, something cute to the side. So cute. And I imagine being a floor, a professional florist, it's not something that maybe a lot of kids think about, oh, I'm going to go into this. How would you uh, encourage, or what about this industry do you think would be worthwhile? Why would you encourage other young people to pursue this as a career? Um, I think it's a really great creative outlet as a career. Um, it's really amazing to be able to kind of conceptualize something in your head and see it come to life. And what I like about floral compared to a lot of different mediums um, is that it is sort of like a temporary uh, 
temporary crash because of course flowers will die. So the turnaround is really fast and you get to make a lot of really pretty things. And it's sort of like a ultimate luxury in a way. <laughs> but um, I don't know, I personally think it's really rewarding because not a lot of people are angry to receive flowers. So <laughs> it's like a very positive kind of field. <laughs> Yeah. You know, like oh man I really didn't want that arrangement like, take it back <laughs> so that has happened one time <laughs> oh yeah well that actually brings me to my next question I did want to know obviously you work in a in a industry where reviews are really important so what how do you handle uh difficult customers have you can you describe a particular scenario I don't mean for this to sound like a job interview question but <laughs> I think that will be interesting to know like how do you maintain um, your business and, you know, deal with the people who make life a bit more difficult? Um, so luckily I haven't had a lot of times where people have hated what I provided. Um, I think the only time that someone wanted me to take something back was when they were angry at the person that delivered it. But I think as long as uh, you do your own kind of quality control and then you do whatever you can to uh, like let's say a customer is really unhappy I would go back and try to fix it as soon as possible or offer you know additional products or just go back and figure out how you can fix the problem mm -hmm. um, that's really important I would never just like walk away if a customer didn't like something I would you know, change the design or just figure out what I could do. <laughs> Thanks. As far as um, personal achievements, what do you think your, uh, what projects, either when you worked with a company like Wynn or on your own, have been your greatest successes or are you most proud of? Um, it's funny because it almost seems like every new project you're like super excited about and you're like, oh my gosh, that was the best one yet. Um, but Working for a larger company, we did do these New Year's events that were really elaborate. Um, and there was always a really, you know, big headliner. So there was a lot of events that we did for like Katy Perry, Usher. And it was just super cool to know that they were in the presence of my flowers when they were performing. And <laughs> that was really exciting. Um, in the Bay Area, I mentioned before, I did the San Francisco Symphony Gala. So that's actually over 400 arrangements and like seven parties going on at the same time. And that logistically was the most challenging, but also super rewarding because um, you look at all the pictures after and you just see how much you accomplished in that short amount of time. And uh, it's just like, just really rewarding to see the final product and everyone having a good time. Do you have any tips for teens who might be interested in pursuing a career in floral arrangement or design? Yes. Well, um, I know we've uh, talked about internships. I think any florist would be happy to have an intern because uh, there really is so much work. But I think um, teens they, or anyone starting out in floral design, they should really realize that it's about 20% design. <laughs> the rest of it is preparation and cleaning. So you really have to uh, be willing to put in the work first to be able to reach like a level of success in floral design. And also practice is super important. Um, I really recommend just taking whatever materials you can find, even in your backyard. I love going in my backyard, just seeing what, is inspiring or foraging in the neighborhood. I mean, don't cut your neighbor's flowers, but like just find things that inspire you and just start playing around. I think that's the best way to learn. And also just looking at other people's arrangements that you like and kind of uh, not copying, but just you know taking that as inspiration is always good as well. I almost forgot, but uh, I understand that you, both you and Jaja, are friend, good friends from high school and have been business partners on occasion. Would either of you want to comment on that? How is it working with a friend, and um, has that how has that worked out for you guys? Oh, um, I think it's been nice to be able to help each other out. Like, 
say I book a wedding, I, I'm doing the photos. And sometimes I do offer flowers too, if it's an intimate wedding, but most now, ever since Jackie moved back to the barrier, I was able to just guide my clients to the her. And then when they book her, that's when I know I have to help her make these flowers too. So it's a really good support system on each other for sure. So I can make sure that we will have beautiful flowers at the wedding day. And um, just having the opportunity to work together at a wedding is just, it's, any best friend's dream come true. Yeah, it's really awesome to be able to have that kind of support and someone that understands what you're uh, going through on a day-to-day -day basis, because not everyone understands the event industry and the, the struggles that you sometimes might go through. So it's good to have someone that you can talk to about that. And also someone that you can trust um, like in business, because of course you want to be able to trust everyone you work with. And it's been really helpful having a photographer friend as well to capture all the flowers. <laughs> Because, you know, flowers are temporary, so a photo is really the lasting keepsake that you have of them. And she's also a great photographer, so lots of beautiful photos. Yeah, you guys have really emphasized how important having a support system is and people to encourage you and support you in your small business effort. So even better that you as good friends were able to join or have been able to join forces. Uh, I see some questions popping up, but before we get to that, I just want to ask you, Jackie, if you could go back in time and give your teenage self some advice about career or life, what would you, what would that advice be? Um, much like Jaja said, uh, to just jump into it. I think he, a lot of times people go into careers that they're not super passionate about because they think that it's, uh, it's the right thing to do or they think that that's the only way. But I think following your heart is usually turns out with better results and it makes me happier in the long run because I'm super happy and fortunate to be able to do something that I really love to do every day. And um, I really wish that, uh, like Josh, I had spent a couple of years uh, just waiting, trying to do like a normal job, I guess. <laughs> so just <laughs> jump into something you really love and go all in. That's great advice. Thank you so much, Jackie. You're welcome. Um, so you guys are more, anybody in the audience, you're more than welcome to put your questions in. We'll share the uh, survey link in a minute too. So if, in case you have to leave early, we do ask that you fill that out to give us your feedback. But I see here a question. Um, Aldrich is asking a very specific question about the process of starting a business, uh, I guess, he wants to, or they want to know about acquiring an LLC, hiring a business advisor. How involved um, were you with this process for each, respectively, for each of you? Um, for me, I did everything on my own. Uh, I applied for an LLC on my own as well. I just did a lot of internet research. Um, it's mostly it because I don't have a lot of full-time employees, the process is a little different for me. I think it's a little simpler because I am a sole proprietorship or, you know, like a single business owner. Um, I didn't feel like it was necessary to pay another, another website to do it for me. It's actually fairly simple once you do a lot of internet research. Thanks. And Jaja, was it similar for you? Uh, also very similar. I think what helped me was um, talking to other photographer friends who I was fortunate to have some mentor friends who basically share um, what they went through. Some did sole proprietor, some did LLC, but also based on how vast you want to do photography on. Um, and I don't think you need to hire a business advisor. There's definitely um, plenty of workshops available online that you can find actually are very helpful. Thank you. Uh, there's another question for you, Jackie, from Jenna. Is there any flower that you have an allergic reaction to? Oh, yes, there are. Um, I'm fortunate to not be allergic to a lot that most people are. Um, I'm allergic to a flower called amaryllis. It comes out in the winter time, normally around Christmas, the pollen actually makes me rash. And also uh, another flower called hanging amaranthus, which is like a fuzzy kind of gray, draping flower. 
uh, touching that also gives me a rash. But luckily I don't sneeze a lot. I don't have that kind of reaction to pollen that a lot of people would, which I imagine would be super hard if you were a florist. <laughs> so the flowers that you do have a reaction to, do you avoid working with those or um, you just wear gloves since you don't have a pollen reaction? Uh, sometimes I wear gloves. Um, luckily, some flowers, a lot of the pollen doesn't come out until uh, later on in the flower's life. So if you use it when it's still closed in a bud form before it blooms, then you won't really have to touch the pollen. Okay. Oh, and let's, uh, okay, there's another question here from Francia. Do flower symbolizations or meanings contribute to the arrangement of a bouquet? Uh, yes, it also depends on the client as well. Um, the thing I've encountered most is, you know, a lot of Asians don't like, um, like, white flowers symbolize death. So I usually have to avoid that when, um, when I know that it's an Asian client, um, just things like that. Uh, but as far as like, just, you know, symbolization like of a rose for love, um, it's just basically up to the client's preference. Okay. From Sunny, is finding the balance between the point flowers and filler flowers really as difficult as people say? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do they say that? <laughs> I think they do say that. Um, uh, I don't think it's as difficult as people say, but you definitely want to have a good balance of like larger focal flowers and smaller accent flowers and you know, wispy bits, depending on the type of arrangement you're trying to do. Um, yeah, but as I keep on saying, it is personal preference. And if, if you want to do an entire arrangement of filler flowers, it's up to you as well. Uh, everyone likes a different style. <laughs> and I have a question too. Do you have any personal favorite flowers or types of flowers to arrange together and or favorite color palettes? Um, I do gravitate towards a lot of pinks. Uh, I wouldn't say that's my favorite color, you know, in real life, but I think in flowers, there's a lot of different shades of pink. So you have everything from like mauve to, you know, fuchsia to uh, like a blush. There's just so many options for pink. So I really like using that in a lot of my arrangements. Uh, for, in terms of flowers, I like anything that's very ruffly and delicate because <laughs> it just, I don't know, it just gives it that little cute touch. Uh, my favorite flower personally is butterfly ranunculus. Uh, you can't really find them every time of the year, but they're delicate and they last a long time. And where do you source most of your flowers from? And is that a kind of a difficult process, finding good um, growers? Um, I usually go to the San Francisco flower market. So I'm lucky to be only 30 minutes away from a large market. Uh, there's not I mean, some people don't have that, that nearby. Um, so the San Francisco Flower Market has probably, I don't know how many vendors, but it seems like at least 30 or 40 vendors. And with that, you get a really large selection. Um, but of course, you know, there's price variation. So it gets time consuming because you're trying to find the best price and the best quality and you have to really be able to uh, navigate that. <laughs> Um, lately though, I've been going to more local, smaller wholesalers, which also have a lot of good product, just a smaller selection. And sometimes Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's actually has really great flowers for anyone oh. to start out. And for those of us who are just maybe looking to, to have a nice, maybe we're not designing our own arrangement, but want something nice for our home, what, um, what are, do you have any tips for what we should look for when we go to, you know, just a grocery store or a floral shop as far as picking out bouquets? What should we be keeping an eye out for? Um, actually, a lot of times um, people want to buy the, the open blooms because they look more beautiful at the time, but you want to look for something that's closed um, because it'll last a lot longer. It might not look as beautiful at the time, but it'll eventually bloom so it gets that big. Like for example, um, in this arrangement, like this is what it would look like if it was not open yet, a little, the petals are tight. And that's good because eventually it'll open into something like this. So you definitely wanna buy it when it's at this stage and it'll last a lot longer. Uh, also changing the water pretty often and cutting the stems maybe every two days is super helpful. 
um, having clean water. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Okay, I see um, one another question from Ed. And again, Lynn put in the chat, but if anybody has any more questions, feel free to, you can turn on your mic if you'd like to. But Edsa asks for both of you, how long did it take you to realize you could turn your passion into your career? Was there a moment or experience that convinced you to go all in? I know you kind of both address this in a way, but if there's anything you, else you wanna share about that, please. Mm. <laughs> Uh, I think the moment I felt truly successful is when uh, strangers started reaching out for arrangements uh, versus, you know, j just your friends. It's like that acknowledgement that people like your work. <laughs> um, it's Hard nowadays with social media because you know there is a lot of competition but you really just have to believe in your own style and your own work um, but I think there's not just like one moment where you're just like oh my gosh this is it it's just kind of just over time <laughs> you realize that you can do it on your own um, for me it was based on how many bookings I was getting. Um, like first year, maybe I'll get five bookings of wedding. And the following year, I'll start getting 15 bookings of wedding. And if I start getting booked more the following year after that already set, that was when I felt comfortable enough to quit my full-time work and also leaving the benefits. <laughs> that was the hard part. <laughs> I think money is a lot too, feeling comfortable with the amount of you're receiving. Right. It just shows like how far you've come and like you, the ball is rolling, right? And um, you have projects lined up, which gives you the confidence knowing that people are hiring for you. They love your work. And um, that's when I realized that it was okay and felt right to pursue it completely. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to give us an idea, a rough estimate of how much um, each uh, event uh, would cost or how much you would charge, like let's say a wedding, uh, depending, let's say a small scale wedding, how much would you charge them uh, for photography and for flowers? I'll start with you, uh, Zsa, Zsa. Um, For me, it varies if it's like they're looking for one photographer, which is be just me, or if it's a larger event, I say if it's more than 60 people, I always have a second photographer. Um, my, I have a starting minimum of um, what my couples will invest in, which is 5000 um, And then the packages can go up to 7000 So I can able to focus maybe like 15 couples a year. Um, that way I'm able to give really good service versus overwhelmed with so many couples and making less or something. That's great. Yeah. How about for you, Jackie? Thank you. Um, for me, it's kind of hard to provide a single quote because it really depends on what they're looking for. Um, if it's like a full wedding, including centerpieces, um, I usually start at around $3,000. Um, it depends on the number, of course, too. So that's for a smaller wedding. Um, arrangements usually start at around, you know, it could be anything, to be honest, from like a tiny bed vase to a huge centerpiece. And it really depends on what kind of flowers people want as well. Um, because, you know, there's things like exotic orchids, which can cost a lot more. Um, so it's actually really hard to give the estimate it's really depending on the type of flowers used mm. no, that, that's good thank you uh, do you guys have any upcoming projects you can share with us or any any events that you'll be doing in the next like few weeks um so i'm lucky enough to have a lot of home deliveries right now it actually seems like during the pandemic uh, people picked up on home deliveries because they can't be there in person so a lot of people have been using flowers to, you know, celebrate birthdays and just special occasions. Uh, so I do have a lot of home deliveries. Um, Josh and I have been working on this style shoot, which 
we ran like run into a couple snags so hopefully that'll be coming up soon as well um a style shoe is pretty much where a bunch of creatives collaborate together to come up with a concept and execute that together wonderful how about for you jaja is that the next project you're working on it or do you have anything else on the side that you're working on um i would be i have one special engagement session that requires traveling. Um, so I'm gonna be at Salt Lake City for the Bonneville Salt Flat coming up. So that'd be really cool scenario for photos versus me going to San Francisco all the time for photos <laughs> with my couple. So it's a nice change. Um, it makes it definitely more exciting and to change it up. Um, but other than that, I think I was just preparing for all my spring weddings that are coming up too. Great, great. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, hopefully with this whole, you know, pandemic, now that it's, you know, getting a little better and we'll see the light of day <laughs> that uh, everybody, everything will hopefully get back to normal and the weddings will be up and ready. So, um, yeah, I, you know, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. I know we're running towards the end of our program, but if there are any other last minute questions that you'd like to ask, now's your chance. And you can ask anything um, re relating to business, flowers, or photography. Anything else? No? And also, um, Jessica linked a survey in the chat box. Please, please do take a moment to fill that out. Uh, so that way we know, you know, what you really enjoyed during career day and how we can do better next time or what are some things that we can uh, do to make your career day fun and exciting. All right, Jessica, anything else? I think that's it, but who do we have next week, Lynn? Do you wanna? All right, so next week I have uh, two friends. One were, is a designer at Netflix and the other is a designer at TikTok. So if you're interested in learning what it takes to become a tech designer, please, please do come to our career day event. Uh, if you've already signed up at bit.ly slash LAPL career day, I will be sure to send you the Zoom link for that event. So yeah, thank you so much everybody yeah. for being here with us today. If you're a teen you. and you're part of teen council, please take a moment to fill out the form uh, for, <laughs> thank you so much guys, the form for uh, the survey as well as your, um, volunteer form so that we can get your community service hours. Bye. Yes, thank you, Jaja and Jackie. And, thank you, um, Jaja and Jackie. Thank you, everyone. And thank thanks you for to everyone. Us. Yeah. Thanks to everyone who came today and take care, everybody. We'll hope to see you next week. Yeah, you guys are <laughs> Thanks, awesome. Roberta. Thank, thank you, you so much, Roberta. Thank you, guys. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.